Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Nova Scribes. Uh, tonight, we're really excited to hear from Andrea Hancock, who's going to be talking to us about engaging adults as visual practitioners. But before we get started, uh, a little bit about Nova Scribes. So, Nova Scribes is a free and open forum for visual practitioners to share their knowledge. We are anyone who uses visuals to move others, that is, say, graphic facilitators graphic recorders, scribes, sketch noters, video scribers, UX designers, and visual consultants. Um, also, we are all volunteers. We're always looking for help. And so anybody who wants to can be an organizer or a presenter. Um, the proceeds from these events go to the presenters and into the meetup for scholarships and to help to build the community of visual practitioners. Uh, we have organized classes, graphic jams, open spaces, and webinars to share skills and learn from each other. We record our webinars as we're doing tonight, and we post them for anyone to be able to watch later, whether you're a member or not. And if you're interested in presenting a topic, please let me know at any time. Uh, we organize our events using the Meetup app. You can find us if you go to meetup.com and search Nova Scribes. Um, and just because I'm sharing my screen, I think I'm sharing my screen. Thumbs up if I'm sharing my screen? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, so here's what's coming up, which I'm really excited to share with you. Uh, tonight we've got Engaging Adults as Visual Practitioners, and then on November 19th, uh, Karina Branson is actually going to be doing an encore presentation of what she shared at this year's International Forum of Visual Practitioners on email marketings for creatives that feels awesome. Um, and then the big event is November 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. We're actually hosting The Grove. So David Sibbett and Gisela Wendling are going to be coming out to present their intensive Designing and Leading Change. Um, and this is not to be missed. This is, uh, they don't, the Grove doesn't get out here very often. So this is a really big deal. If you can make it to, to D.C. for that, that would be a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime type, type thing to do. Um, I will share, there's a few other things that are happening, happening with Nova Scribes that we haven't posted yet, but we're planning um, a speed business mentoring where we're inviting um, seasoned practitioners to come in um, and serve as mentors to everybody else in the field in the D.C. area where you can come and get one-on-one -on -one advice from people who have been in the business for a while. Uh, we also have a uh, graphic recording 101 uh, meetup that's coming up. And then we also have a visioning session that we're scheduling um, to do visioning for ourselves for 2020. Uh, a lot of the work that we do as visual practitioners is to help people see their future. We've decided to take our own medicine uh, and to do some vi visioning for ourselves internally. So that's going to be coming up. So watch Meetup for that. We'll be posting those soon. Um, so today's session is scheduled to be 120 minutes. Andrea, thumbs up if I got that right. About two hours. Cool. Okay. Um, and so let's just do a quick tech check. Uh, can you see and hear me? And if your camera is on, just go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Good. Carrie, how about you? I can see you, but I don't see you moving. All right. Looks like your audio is a, or you, you may have a bit of a, uh, of a, of a challenge with your connection. If anyone does have a challenge, uh, technology related, please post that in the chat of Zoom, and I'll go ahead and help you so as not to interrupt Andrea and make sure that she's got um, enough space in order to be able to, to present. Um, we are recording, and so after a little bit of light video editing, I will post this video on YouTube and make it available for anybody who would like to check it out. Please mute yourself if you're not talking, um, and if I am picking up some background noise for you, I will mute you. Um, it's nothing personal. It just means that something's coming through your end. Um, so you have chat. Let me just go ahead and make sure you know how to use that. So I'll post a quick hi in Zoom chat. Uh, and if you've got that, you can go ahead and, and reply back to me. We'll also be posting some useful links and resources in the chat log, which we'll also share after this. A okay? um, couple of other things about Zoom before I, I turn it over to Andrea. Um, you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view, and that should be an option in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. So depending on if you want to just see the speaker or see everybody that's on the call, that's up to you if you want to do that. Um, and you can click around using different videos. Okay. So let's just do one more test. So how excited are you tonight to have Andrea present to us on engaging adults? You can say one, which is not at all. I could care less. I thought this was underwater basket weaving. Or you could say five. I'm really super excited about this. So quick, you know, just a five. Aisha's like going bananas. She's like up to 100 now. Okay. okay, great. 10. Thanks, David. 
All right. So a little bit of about Andrea. Andrea holds a Bachelor of Arts in English, a graduate certificate in e-learning, and a Master's of Education in Instructional Design, which is really why she's here. She's a member of the Association for Talent Development, ATD, formerly AS, if you know that, the e-learning guild, and our favorite, the International Forum of Visual Practitioners. Andrea has 15 years of experience as an instructional designer, designing and developing classroom online and blended learning experiences. She has successfully worked with images and charts in training and meetings to promote critical thinking and problem solving in her years as a government contractor. I could say a lot more, but I want to turn the time over to her. Okay, Andrea, the time is yours. I can't wait. I've really been looking forward to this for a long time. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Brian. And thank you all for being here and being excited. I like seeing all the tens. Um, we've got a number of things to get covered this evening, so I'm going to try and keep things moving. If I'm going too fast or if you don't understand something that I'm saying or there's technical difficulties, please just say something in the chat and Brian will flag me down and let me know. Otherwise, if you wouldn't mind, I put a link to Mural in the chat window. Can everybody see that? We're going to switch over to Mural for a lot of the presentation. Here, I'll put it in again, just in case. Okay, and we're gonna go over to Mural. You may get moved around a little bit. Um, there's a lovely feature that says, I'm summoning you. So you may get summoned. Okay, if everybody is over at Mural now, this session is engaging adults as visual practitioners. As Brian said, it's gonna go about two hours. We wanted to go through a lot of things, but really there's enough on this topic that I could talk to you for a few years. So we're going to do a very high level on just a few specific topics. If there are other things that you wanna talk about, we can do that either in the office hours or in a different session. We're going to go through and do um, introductions so that we all get an idea of who's in the room, what your role is. Um, then we're gonna get into expectations, go into what you guys want out of the session today. I came up with what I thought would be most useful to you. And so I'd like to hear from you if there are specific things that you were hoping to get out of today. And I'm not Italian, but I do talk with my hands, so you may see them moving around if you're watching the video. After the introductions and expectations, we'll get into content. We'll talk a little bit about preparation ahead of a session, um, objectives, the, the ever, ever fun with them, which we'll get into what that means, learning styles and what influences them, and really why you care about learning styles if you're not specifically a teacher or an instructor. So the first thing we're going to do is go over here to introductions. Let me see if I can summon everybody. If you wouldn't mind just creating a post-it note, put your name on it and put it in the box that best describes your main role when you're working with adults. If it's not represented up there, then put your name on a post-it note, put, your, put what role you do have and stick it in that box that says I was way off the mark. Once everybody's got their uh, name and post-it note in there. We'll go around the room quick and just have people say what their name and their role is. And I want to hear one interesting non-work thing about you. Matt, can you tell me your role? I really don't want you to get into an accident while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfectly. Go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So I'm a coach and an agile coach, and I'm part of a movement that helps people create better ways to work. So in a way, I feel in the age of organizational development, but I also do a lot of training. There's usually a lot of overlap between those two. I'll be perfectly happy. Thanks, Matt. Got it. Thank you. So we don't distract you later. You want to share one non-work interesting thing? I'm the only European who can drive stick shift. 
Okay. Okay, as everybody else uh, fills in their post-it notes, why don't we start up with the facilitator and graphic facilitators. Carla, you want to start? Uh, sure. So one, one interesting thing now I'm work related. Um, I am teaching myself to play the dulcimer. Oh, nice. Is that very hard? Uh, no, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you want to go next? Sure. So I'm Brian. I'm a graphic facilitator. Um, one interesting thing about me that has nothing to do with work is I have no idea what a dulcimer is. I'll have to Google that. Um, no, I, uh, I built my own canoe. Nice. Cool. Have you tried seeing if it's seaworthy? Oh yeah, we uh, yeah used it for years. Great. Okay, do we have anybody else that's entering into that facilitator graphic facilitator box? Okay, why don't we go over to the graphic recorder? Hi, I'm David. I can't think of anything interesting to say about myself at this moment. Um, <clears throat> So I just won't say anything. Okay. Let's see. Lynn, how about you next? Sure. Hi. Um, I'm doing change management and actually agile coaching also right now. Something interesting is I'm getting ready to go on a trip to uh, Mexico for the Day of the Dead Festival next week. Can't wait. Oh, that sounds awesome. I bet you get some great pictures down there. Oh, yeah. I'm excited. Carrie, you want to go next? Hi, um, I live in an extremely windy city and our, tonight our expected winds are supposed to be around 70 kilometers an hour. Oh, wow. Yeah, we had a windy day today, but not nearly that windy. And Matt, or is that the Matt that we already talked to? That's the Matt we already talked to. How about we go down to training and education? Debbie? Hi, I'm Debbie DeLue and I live in the Denver area and I spend most of my time doing visual thinking training. And one interesting thing about me is um, I recently bought a book about rhetoric, which is the art of arguing oh. to get your way. <laughs> <laughs> And how far into it are you? Oh, I'm in like the third chapter. So <laughs> I have a long ways to go. It's a very big book. So I think you'll be winning a lot of the arguments tonight. <laughs> we'll see. Aisha, you want to go next? Sure, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Aisha. I live in Leesburg, Virginia. And right now I'm doing training and education. I also do strategic planning um, and systems integration for the government. And... Uh, one non-work related thing, I lead yoga nidra meditation. Oh. And Avra, how about you? Hi everyone, um, I am in Washington DC and in my spare time I really like doing photography. Great, and it's very neat that you work at ATD. I may have to pick your brain later about some of their fun. Yes, please. <laughs> Since I put my post-it note in that box too, I'll just share. Um, as Brian mentioned at the beginning, I'm an instructional designer and have been for a very long time. A few years ago, I started incorporating more graphic facilitation and visuals because it's a very natural fit into the classroom. Visuals are a great way to anchor memory. So um, one interesting thing about me, um, I live outside of the DC area and and I'm not an interesting person. So my dog likes to eat electrical cords. That's been our fun this week. <laughs> Matt, you wanna go? Yeah, um, uh, I'm Matt. I am a UX designer, which there are days it feels like I do all of these things. Um, but I, and uh, an odd thing about me is I'm a former pastry chef. That's actually part of why I'm here today. See, this is the, if we had been in person, we could have had snacks, but instead 
we're all here and I didn't have to clean to host everybody. So, <laughs> Dee, you want to talk about yours? Sure, let me make sure everybody can see me. I'm not sure. Um, hello, I am Dee Dee Ray. I am a strategic planning um, and change leadership uh, leader, and I work in business transformation. So what I do is I shake the shoebox with organizations, and then after I make a mess, I help them fish through it as we all kind of blend through change. And I'm just very excited about this whole um, um, session today and even graphical recording. I met someone in a class I was in about two weeks ago, and that's how I joined Meetup to begin with. So um, it's something interesting. Uh, gosh. I had, I would say probably about 25 years ago, I was a, a aspiring artist and I had some um, artwork in some of the government buildings downtown. So some people don't think a person who's technical could have creativity, but it's absolutely true you can. That's very cool. Have you gotten to go see them hanging up? I have. Good. And I brag and I'm like, what do you think? What does it look like? <laughs> Good, you should. Well, welcome to Meetup and Nova Scribes, too. Thank you so much. Mary Jo, you want to talk about it? Maybe we'll Mary go Mary Jo, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Well. You're off mute. Well, I don't think that was the problem. I think it's your microphone. Let's go ahead and try that again. Yeah, you're off mute now. I think it may be the microphone that you're using. <coughs> That's okay. I'll help you troubleshoot offline. Why don't, you, why don't we go ahead? Um, anyway, Mary Jo, keep an eye on the chat. Hopefully we'll get you. Uh, up soon. <laughs> Ashanti, you want to go ahead? Yes, um, hello. So I am uh, fairly new to uh, graphic recording and I'm just stepping into facilitation at work. I work for a government agency and um, so one interesting thing is I'm learning the harmonica. That's awesome. Great. Sounds like we got uh, a couple of duets in here. You and Carla can go. Um, Make us a song. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you for introducing yourselves. It's really nice to meet all of you and hear what diversity we have in the group. Um, I like seeing that we have some coaches in here too. Um, I'm really interested to hear your take on some of these as well. So let's pop over to expectations. Um, now that I made you all create post-it notes, I'm gonna make you create more post-it notes. Um, or if you want to share verbally, that's fine too. But just give me an idea of what do you want to get out of our session tonight? Is there anything that you were already expecting that you're really looking forward to? So we have a couple coming in that I'd like to understand how adults learn so that I can keep it in that in mind as I design facilitation. General familiarity with the field of visual practitioner and engaging with customers. Help tie my interest in talent development with graphic recording. Learning more about engaging adults during training workshops. Up my instructional design skills. I design and facilitate a lot of workshops with, with techies. Yes, that can be fun to get them engaged. Um, better understand how adults give and receive feedback. 
Okay. Did I miss any or is that all the ones that are there? Is there anything anybody wanted to add before we move on? Yeah, I'd like to throw in one real quick. I would like uh, to know of any misconceptions, any, any general misconceptions that are still uh, being thrown around, but they're no longer true uh, as they've been the last couple of years or so. Okay. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, a lot of what we will talk about in terms of engagement is first different ways that you can get in to get into adults engaged and then some different ways that you can tell if they're engaged and if they're not how you might be able to re-engage them. So we had um, better understand how adults give and receive feedback online relative to visual auditory olfactory stimuli. Okay, so the objectives that I came up with today, at, um, we'll go into what objectives are later, just to help you set, be able to either set them yourself if you need to for facilitating or to understand the ones that are being used for sessions that you might be either facilitating or recording or just supporting. Um, at the end of this web webinar, You'll be able to identify questions to ask your client that will help you better plan for the event, discuss what objectives are and why they're useful, explain the importance of relevance to adult participants, recall different learning styles, discuss the better retention of information with more engaging activities, and discuss when and ways to assess audience engagement. So first we're going to go into that questions side of things, which is really a lot of the preparation that you do ahead of time. So when you are either assigned a project or have accepted a project, what's one of the first things you do? I have to write post-it notes. You can just say it. This is Brian. One of the uh, first things that I do is I try to ask him a whole bunch of questions. Um, mostly, what is it you'd like to get out of this? Um, and one of my favorite questions to ask is, what do you want the experience to be? And I try to keep them as focused on mood as possible, which is to say, as people are leaving at the end of the day, uh, what do you want the mood to be? Do you want them to be dedicated, ready to go to work, um, uh, focused on the task, or do you want them to be uh, energized, uh, motivated, so the experience is something that I try to nail down. And that's a really great way of asking them about what they want out of it. And, and I like the idea of what mood do you want them to have at the end? Um, a lot of this is, a lot of the questions that we go when we are scoping a project go towards what does the client want to get out of it at the end? What is their main goal? Why are we here in the first place? And if you are the one that's putting together or facilitating the session, you need to know where you're supposed to be at the end of it. So does anybody else have any key questions that they ask? Andrea, it's Aisha. I usually, uh, from a training perspective, my number one uh, question that I ask, I don't always get answered, is what is the performance gap that you're trying to meet? Yes, that's always a good one too. That gets, especially training wise, that gets into a lot of the, why are we here? You know, you've asked to meet with me and, you know, and you've given me this project, this task to, to create this, but why? What are we trying to fix? What are we trying to solve? What are we trying to get to? And especially with training, you really are trying to have to meet specific objectives. So one of my least favorite questions that I hope none of you ever ask is, what do you want me to do? Because if you tell the client that, you will get assigned every, anything and everything, and you probably won't get done what they wanted you to get done. You need to focus on their need. Like Aisha was just saying, you know, what is it that's driving them to do this? What's the performance gap? What's the problem? You need to focus on their need, not your role. And depending on what your role is, it could change depending on what they need. 
at the end there, yeah, I've got the um, in quotes, I want you to develop a three day training course and my little broken heart right next to that. Because every time I get somebody that comes up to me and says, I want you to develop a three day training course, it makes me want to cry. We ask, especially in the training industry, but just in general, we ask them to come to us with their problem. What is going wrong? And let us help you come up with what that solution is. Because a three day training course, is very arbitrary. You don't know that that's how much time you're gonna need. You don't know that that's the best venue for being able to convey what you're trying to convey. And it may not be the, re the real problem to begin with. If you have a business process, like a software um, chain that goes from office to office, if that is what's really wrong, then training isn't going to do anything to fix it. You may teach people how to use this, pro this uh, business process that doesn't work, but it's not going to fix any of the problems you have. Some other questions that are good to ask is, you know, what's driving the request? You know, what's the context behind the session? Like Brian mentioned about mood. Is this a mandatory event and they have to be there and no one really wants to be there? Um, is there some kind of a reorganization or buyout or something and you really want to boost morale so that people feel better about it? And ask, you know, your client, ask your client, is there any, data, is there any information that you, that they have that you need that would help you put things together? Because sometimes there's key information that's left out that it, you go back later and you said, well, if I'd known that, I might have done things a little differently. Um, another fun one is how will they use my work afterward? This is great for when you are either the graphic facilitator or the recorder, because you know the client is going to have your work and what are they going to do with it? Are, is it only going to be the people in the audience that see your work? And they'll have, they'll have the context of, this is what we did in that session, this is, how, this is where this came from. Or will it be put up on a wall or put up on a website or something like that so that people who weren't there are gonna see it? And if they see it, will they understand it? Or will it be a lot of gobbledygook to them? Knowing your audience is a very important thing. Um, if you know how many people will be there, know who is in the room is always an important one. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite stories, least favorite, is um, there's, I worked on a certification course that was several weeks long. And the certification course was meant to teach the participants how to do their job, very in-depth, and it would certify that they could do this job at the end of it. One of the biggest tasks that they had to do was something called a file review. And so we arranged for someone to come and to talk in depth with them about it. We gave them a couple hours, you know, just got it all set up. When the presenter arrived, we walked in, walked to the front of the room, gave a very, you know, 10,000 foot overview of what this thing was, and then said, and when you go to the certification course, you'll learn a lot more about it. And all of the people that were sitting in the back watching what just happened froze and said, oh no. Because he didn't know who he was talking to. He didn't know what class this was. He didn't know who was in the room. And so he went in and just gave them nothing of what they needed. Let's see. Um, Okay, is there any other uh, questions that people ask that they find are really essential? I like one that was just added, what would success look like? And it goes a lot into what does the client want to get at the end of the session? What have you already tried is a really interesting one because that could change a lot of what you might try based on what has not worked before or what you might be able to build on that did work before. Why do you believe training is the solution? Oh, if I can. The answer I usually get to a question like that is because my boss said we, that we need training. So it's a lovely question, but it will never get a a, a accurate answer. So while we're going through this, I have a video that I wanted to show. 
And let's see if I can get this to work. I'm going to go back to Zoom and share my screen. Our company has a new strategic initiative to increase market penetration, maximize brand loyalty, and enhance intangible assets. In pursuit of these objectives, we've started a new project for which we require seven red lines. I understand your company can help us in this matter. Of course. Walter here will be the project manager. Walter, we can do this, can't we? Yes, of course. Anderson here is our expert in all matters related to the drawing of red lines. We've brought him along today to share his uh, professional opinion. Nice to meet you. Well, you all know me. This is Justine, our company's design specialist. Hello. We need you to draw seven red lines, all of them strictly perpendicular, some with green ink and some with transparent. Can you do that? No, I'm afraid... Let's not rush into any hasty answers, Anderson. Uh, the task has been set and needs to be carried out. At the end of the day, you are an expert. The term red line implies the colour of the line to be red. To draw a red line with green ink is... Well, if it's not exactly impossible, it's pretty close to being impossible. What does that even mean? Impossible! <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, it is possible there are some people, say, suffering from colour blindness, for whom the colour of the lines doesn't really make a difference. But I'm quite sure that the target audience of your project doesn't consist solely of such people. <laughs> so in principle, this is possible? I'll simplify. A line as such can be drawn with absolutely any ink, but if you want to get a red line, you need to use red ink. Why don't we draw them with blue ink? Mm, mm. It still won't work. If you use blue ink, you'll get blue lines. And what exactly did you mean when you talked about the transparent ink? Mm, how to put explain? I'm sure you know what transparent means. Uh, yes, I do. And what a red line means. I hope I don't need to explain to you. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> but you need to draw a red line with transparent ink. Could you describe what you imagine the end result would look like? Oh, come on, Anderson. What have we got here? Kindergarten. No, <laughs> I'm just trying to no, get no, Let's no. not waste our time with these unproductive Quarrels. The task has been set, the task is plain and clear. Now, if you have any specific questions, then go ahead. You're the expert here. All right, let's leave aside the colour for the moment. Uh, you had something there also relating to perpendicularity. Seven lines, all strictly perpendicular. To what? Um, to everything amongst themselves. I assume you know what perpendicular lines are like. Of course he does. He's an expert. Two lines can be perpendicular. All seven can't be simultaneously perpendicular to each other. I'll, I'll show you. This is a line, right? Uh, yes. And another, is it perpendicular to the first line? Well... Yes, it is perpendicular. Exactly. Uh, oh, wait, wait, I'm not done. And a third one, is it perpendicular to the first line? Yes, it is. But it doesn't cross the second line. They're both parallel. Not perpendicular. Oh, suppose so. There it is. Two lines can be perpendicular. Can I have the pen? How about this? This is a triangle. It's definitely not perpendicular lines. And there are three, not seven. Why are they blue? Indeed, I wanted to ask that myself. Uh, I have a blue pen with me. This was just a demonstration. That's the problem, your lines are blue. Draw them with red ink. It won't solve the problem. But how do you know before you've tried? <laughs> Let's draw them with red ink, then let's see. Hmm? I, I, I don't have a red pen with me, but I'm completely certain that with red ink, the result will still be the same. Uh, didn't you tell us earlier that you could only draw red lines with red ink? In fact, yes, I've written that down here. And now you want to draw them with blue ink. Do you want us to call these red lines? <laughs> I think I understand. You're not, you, you, you're not talking about the colour now, right? You're talking about that, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, perpendic... Dick, uh, per perpendicularity, <laughs> yes! That's it. Now you've confused everyone. So what exactly is stopping us from doing this? Geometry. Just ignore it. We have a task. 
seven red lines. It's not 20, it's just seven. Anderson, I understand you're a specialist of a narrow field. You don't see the overall picture. But surely it's not a difficult task to draw some seven lines. Exactly. Suggest a solution that any fool can criticize. Uh, no offense. But you're an expert. You should know better. OK. Uh, let me draw you two perfectly perpendicular red lines. And I will draw the rest with transparent ink. They'll be invisible, but I'll draw them. Would this suit us? Yes, this will suit us. Uh, uh, yes, but at least a couple with green ink. Oh, and, and I have another question, if I may. Uh, can you draw one of the lines in the form of a kitten? A uh, uh, what? In the form of a kitten? Market research tells us our users like cute animals. It would be really great if we could... No. Uh, uh, but why? Look, I can of course draw you a cat. I'm no artist, but I can give it a try, but it won't be a line anymore, it'll be a cat. A line and a cat, these are two different things! A kitten. Not a cat, but a kitten. They're little, cute, cuddly. Cats, on the other hand, It, it won't are... make a difference. Anderson, at least hear her out. She hasn't even finished speaking and you're already saying no. I, I got the idea, but it's impossible to draw a line in the form of a cat. Done. What about a bird? So, where do we stop? What are we doing? Uh, seven red lines, uh, two with red ink, two with green ink, and the rest with transparent. Did I understand correctly? Yes. Excellent! In which case, that's everything, right? Oh, I almost forgot. We also have our red balloon. Do you know if you could inflate it? What do I have to do with balloons? It's red. Anderson, can you or can you not do this? A simple question. As such, I can, of course, but... Excellent! Organise a business trip. We'll cover the expenses, go over to their location, inflate the balloon. Well, this is very productive. Thank you all. Can I ask you one more question, please? When you inflate the balloon, could you do it in the form of a kitten? Of course I can. I can do anything. I can do absolutely anything. I'm an expert. Okay, hopefully not too many people got flashbacks or PTSD from that video because we've all been in this. The Okay, so if we pop back to Mural and we'll go to and talk a little bit about objectives. Um, objectives are very important in training. We're not really getting into the full spiel about what you would do with them in training. The basic thing is our, you know, you, you go back to that, what does the client want to get at the end of the session? And hopefully it's not red lines and a balloon. But sometimes um, if you don't coordinate with them and the other people that you're working with, you may show up and they are expecting you to do something that you can't do or didn't know you had to be prepared, be prepared to do. Um, if you thought you were going there to graphic record and they expected you to facilitate, uh, or if you are the graphic recorder and you show up and they say, oh, well, we expect all these extras that you can't necessarily do, like drawing portraits of all the speakers. So with objectives, we go back to that, what does the client want to get at the end of the session? We have objectives and we have goals. The difference between the two, the objectives is a very specific, it's a desired outcome and how you plan to achieve it of a very specific uh, task or very specific session. Um, are they different than goals? Yes, because goals are broader, higher level. You might have an overarching goal for a series of sessions or for a whole program, but when you get down to one session, you have specific objectives that you want to meet by the end of that session. So when we go back to our objectives for tonight, you know, identify questions to ask your client, um, discuss what objectives are and explain the importance and relevance. 
these are all things that I'm hoping that you will be able to do by the end of our session tonight, not in a few years or after a few more sessions. In training, we have this lovely phrase that we use in front of our objectives to help us remember what it is that we are driving towards. And um, the short name for it is SWABAT. And it's at the end of the session, the student will be able to. And then you have to complete that sentence and that will be your objective. When you're doing your objectives, there's another acronym that's good to use for it and it's called SMART objectives. SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. You need to make your objectives specific because as, you, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, desired outcome and how you plan to achieve it. You have a very specific thing that you want to get to in each objective. Um, measurable. How will you determine if the, ob if the objective is met? Um, if you're saying at the end of this session, the student will be able to write an objective, then that's what you will be able to do. That's your action verb is you will be able to write an objective. Um, you don't want to say, you don't want to use words like understand and learn, because if you say student will learn about an objective, well, what, what are they supposed to do with that? What's the action, the active verb that they're going to take? Oh, okay. Well, if we measure to measure it, if we say we're going to measure they, if, whether they've learned an objective by having them write one, that's really what you want to use is the objective piece of things is that measurable side. Attainable. These are time bound, which goes into the timely piece too. You want them to be able to achieve it during that session, not across a, a few sessions, not across years, not with sessions and job related experience, not, you know, their college education. This is very specific. Um, relevant is important for everybody, but especially for adults because um, adults will not stay with you if it's not relevant. We'll get into that one next, but it's something like if you are talking about objectives and you're learning to write them, you wouldn't make an objective in there that said, I'm going to learn how to cook lasagna. Because as tasty as that would be for whoever was in the next session, that's not at all what we're going to do. So that's not something that's measurable, attainable, relevant at all. Um, if you're the facilitator, it's really important to know and work with your client on the objectives ahead of time because you are the one who's going to be responsible for meeting them. You're the one that they expect to be able to deliver this, to work with the participants so they can make their, their, their session successful and useful. If you're the graphic recorder, you also really would like to know the objectives because it can help you plan out your canvas for the event. If you know that these are the main pieces that everybody wants to get to by the end of the night, you know that those are going to be the highlights. So they might be the biggest text. You might need a lot of icons and images around that side of things. You might want to dev devote more paper space to it. It'll help you gauge what you need during the session. So going back to adults and relevance, I said the term earlier with them, and it stands for what's in it for me. This, if there's nothing else that you take away from tonight, take away with them because adults are all about the with them. We all have tons of demands on our time, tons of demands on our attention. Why am I here? Am I wasting my time with this? Am I getting something out of this? You know, why, what's in it for me? If you can convince, if you can get that across as quickly as possible, as often as possible, then you can keep them more engaged because they'll see that there's a point to paying attention. So going on to learning styles. And you can tell me if I don't need to keep summoning everybody. I'm not sure how much it's, it follows me around the page. So Let's see, do we need a break yet or is everybody good? I think we got a few more minutes. So for learning styles and what influences them. How many of you have heard of learning styles? You know, give me, give me a thumbs up if you've heard of them before. Okay. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Um, 
there is a lot of disagreement about how many learning styles there are. You'll hear, you'll see different styles of research saying, oh, there's only really three, or here there's four, or seven, or eight. There's a lot of different learning styles. The, the exact number of them is not the important part. Um, I found a nice graphic on here uh, from the Advantage Learning Center that lays them out um, as verbally. So uh, words, you prefer to use the words both in speech and writing, whether you have to say it, present it, whether you have to write it down. Visual, you prefer to use pictures, diagrams, images, spatial understanding to help you learn. Musical and auditory prefers using sounds or music um, or even rhythms to help you learn. You'll, if uh, a lot of offices or classes or sessions, you'll notice that they have some music going in the background and sometimes that's to help the, some of those musical learners. To, it helps them keep their focus better. Um, physical and kinesthetic learners is touch. You use your hands, your body. Um, you, you have to touch things and try things. Um, logical, mathematical, um, you want to know the reasoning, the systems, the, the specifics of how something works. You want to walk through it step by step. Um, social, you want to learn things as part of a group. This is especially good for extroverts. I know for me in particular, um, when I was in college, I got far more out of the discussions in the class than I did the reading that I hadn't done from the night before. Solitary, there are people who would much rather go off, learn on their own, and then come back and bring the learning back to the classroom after they've already gone through it. Combination, there's a lot of us who fit multiple learning styles here. I know for me, um, other than the social learning side of things, I really have to write something down to remember it. Um, I can you know, read it all I want, but if I really want to remember it, I have to write it down. Um, what learning styles do you all have? You can come off mute or you can do a post-it note either way. So you've already got a number of combination learning styles. I'm not really sure that you could find anybody that can say they have truly only one of these. I think everybody has a certain level of combination, especially when you have them laid out like this, because social and solitary is a good, you know, that's a, a specific one that's different than visual. So we have a lot of visual learners, which is not surprising given a group like this. Um, a lot of uh, kinesthetic. What kinds of things do you need for kinesthetic? Are there any, are there particular things that you have to do? You know, do you, if you're, uh, do you have to try it if there's uh, instructions or a diagram of something? Doodling is a good one. Uh, and that's another thing that sometimes instructors have to learn over time. And it goes back to that engagement side of things too. If you see somebody who is not looking at you, not making eye contact, but they're, they're looking down and writing something, they're probably still paying attention. They're either taking notes on what you're saying or they might be doodling. And even if they're doodling, that doesn't mean that they're drifting off and going a different direction. Sometimes there are some people who have to ha be doing something with their hands and something like that to help them stay focused. So doodling is not a bad thing. You shouldn't discourage it in a session. Okay. Has everybody got something? Simulations is a good one. And that actually is gonna go into some of the things we're gonna talk about next. So I'm gonna pop down to the next area.
So you appeal to their learning style. It's a great experience. Everything clicks into place. You're done. No, there's always other influences. Think about things that, you, that are going through your mind when you go into a classroom. You are not parking your life at the door. Um, consider the environment. Is the room too cold or too warm? There are some people that can't pay attention if they're freezing. Um, is it early in the morning or late in the afternoon? There are some, do you have people who are morning people and some people who are more night people? How they pay attention can vary based on what time of day it is. Has it been a long time since they had a break? Please, please, please give people breaks, not just because they might need coffee or to go to the bathroom, but breaks are good because it gives your brain a pause point where they can stop, absorb, and start to process what you've said. There are a lot of different classes and sessions that say, oh, well, let's just work through lunch and we'll get through out of here a little bit earlier today. That's really not a good practice. They need that brain break in the middle of the day. Um, have there been any, any major distractions? My personal favorite distraction in the classroom is when there's a fire drill because nothing interrupts the flow more than everybody having to get up, leave the building, stay out there for a while, and then come back in. And all of a sudden you've lost 20 minutes and everybody's distracted talking about other things now. Um, consider the person. You know, like I said, you don't park your life at the door. Did they get enough sleep? Was traffic horrible? What else might be going on in their lives that they're thinking about? Maybe they're about to go on a trip and so mentally they're, they're packing their suitcases. Um, maybe they have a newborn and so they haven't slept in weeks. Um, there's, there's people, um, like Carla was just saying, people from different time zones or multiple languages. There's going to be a lot of different things that are distractions or that disconnect people that they're having different experiences. So you can appeal to everybody's learning style and it, you can be the best that you've ever been and hitting all the marks and there will still be some people that just can't engage. And it's not about you, it's about them. Let's see, so we'll pop over to the cone of experience. Now, some of you may have seen this in a slightly different form. Um, when looking at how people learn over the years, many researchers have discovered that the more involved the participant is in the learning, the more they actually learn and retain. So Edgar Dale set this out visually in the cone of experience. At the top, there is the least interactive method of learning, which would be you know, verbal symbols, you know, reading something that's written. And then it goes all the way down the pyramid to the most interactive, which is a direct purposeful experience, something like an internship or a shadowing program, something like that. Um, the version that you've probably seen with this comes with something along the lines of the, the top is, you know, they, they retain 10% of what they read, 20% of what they see and hear, you know, 30% of what's demonstrated. So that goes around a lot. It's been debunked and argued passionately for years and years. The um, poor National Training Laboratory that put out a graph with the retention rates back in, I think it was the 1960s or 70s, they have gotten so beat up over it. They stand by it very firmly, even though they cannot produce the original research anymore. It's, it's kind of a blind following at this point. Personally, I prefer another model that's called the Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve. The, uh, this is a higher level model um, that takes into account that there are, um, that the numbers change based on the information, how it was presented, if it was reinforced after the fact. Um, it shows a more of a scale over time rather than absor absorption based on the method of presentation. And honestly, who wouldn't love a model called the forgetting curve? That's just such a fun name. So let's go back to that concept of the WIFM. What's in it for you? And I'm not talking about the metaphorical you, now I'm talking about you that's sitting here through this webinar, hopefully not going, why am I here? But it's what, what does this matter to you about retention rates and learning styles and, and how quickly somebody forgets something? You want to make the message stick. 
no matter what it is you're doing, whether you're teaching, whether you're facilitating, whether you're recording, you're trying to convey a message that you want your participants to remember. So, so you have to ask yourself some questions. As the facilitator, how can you appeal to multiple learning styles? As the recorder, how can you do that? What can you do to enhance and improve the retention of the information? Some of that is stylistic, based on what you prefer to do with your images or on your canvas or up in front of the classroom. But some of it is very, there's a lot of research out there on how to anchor specific information, how to make it stickier. And if none of you have, if, um, if you haven't already read the book, How to um, Make It Stick, that is a great book and it has awesome concepts and lots of great suggestions. Okay, it is 8.04. I think that probably everybody kind of needs a break for a few minutes. So why don't we take a quick break and we'll come back at 8.10. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay, everybody, welcome back. Thank you for coming back from your break, since I know it's an easy point for you to just leave. Um, we're going to do a quick breakout group time. So we're going to break into groups so that you guys can talk a little bit more um, and not have any, any uh, and have a little bit more time to share experiences. So when you go out into your breakout groups, groups, what I would like you to talk about is what's the worst or the least engaging adult learning experience you've ever had? That could be college, it could be a webinar, or it could be an online training, it could be classroom, it could have been vocational training, um, a, a meeting, you know, an all hands meeting where they, came, where they were trying to con communicate new information about something like a buyout or a reorganization. So what was the worst or least engaging experience and what was it that made it so bad? Now, after everybody, after each person shares their experience, I'd like the group to, to work with them to respond and say, you know, what are some suggestions that might have improved the experience? Uh, and come back in about 15 minutes. If everybody's done before then, just um, come back to the main chat and we'll get going. Otherwise, I'll call you all back in about 15 minutes. Um, we were talking about, um, I think a lot of slide decks, like monotonous slide decks, where it's just like someone talking at, at us, um, were the big kind of theme that came up. That's a big thing with engagement too with adults, you really want them to feel invested in the outcome and invested in the conversation. And so if there is no conversation, if it's just a monologue, it's hard to keep them engaged. Were there any other big ones that popped out? Andrea, we were talking in our group about um, when you uh, start off a particularly a training session with, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't know anything, so that's why we're all here to get trained. So not, not acknowledging, particularly in an adult learning setting, that people are coming with experiences and kind of the very negative effects it has to launch into an, a learning event with that kind of a mindset. That's a really important point too, because you are going to get a diversity of people with a diversity of experiences. It's not, it's not like, you know, third graders, you can assume that they know what was taught in second grade and they know what was taught in first grade and that they have a fairly limited realm of experience at that point. But with adults, they're not all the same age. They're not all the same background. They've all had different life experiences. Even if you get a group that is all one profession, They've all come to it in different ways. Any other big points? Or does anybody want to share what suggestions the group had for them? I really like um, the thought of using a visual scribe. Um, 
if you're doing an online session like this and and I know Brian does it really well and he'd be a good good example to follow but visual scribing is is really great to have mm -hmm. yep that's a good one and it's a nice artifact to take away from it too Okay, nobody wants to share. I'll continue. <laughs> um, as uh, having collaborative space and breakout sessions like you had uh, in, in today's session, that always works really well. And um, creating enough space for people to have conversation and um, just uh, and markups. If you're going to use um, some kind of presentation slide using some markups. Okay. Yeah, I found that if you make people talk to each other, they're not sleeping. So, um, Lynn and uh, Didi and I talked, this is Ashanti, we talked about um, remote, like, uh, learning. And one of the things that Lynn, um, that I, Lynn, you can chime in, I'm going to put you on the spot. But one of the things that she started doing is actually calling the remote learners individually and just sort of engaging with them. Then by the time you get to class, there's a connection there. And the person and the person tends to feel more involved um, that's a really great idea too kind of get, kind of getting them involved before they even get there creating that sense of space and community before the online session exactly I have um, our headquarters is here so most of my workshops are face to face but we have two remote offices so we'll sometimes get four or five so I'm just calling four or five people in advance that um, are, you know, are remote to build the rapport with those four or five. Uh, and it's interesting because they are then definitely more engaged and much more vocal um, throughout the entire workshop. So yeah, it, is a, it, was a, it was a good best practice that somebody else suggested to me. The people that are remote that come to your workshops, do they get back to their, to your headquarters frequently or are they you know like in another state or a different part of the world um both some of them are in the office maybe once a month and some of them never come back to our headquarters so okay so it's a good sense of connection for them too since they aren't there to be able to connect back in person exactly okay so any any last ones anybody wants to share Um, that we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but I recently have taken a lot of diversity and inclusion training. And one of the things that uh, was really um, an eye opener in, in creating an inclusive space for people to meet and learn is um, starting to ask what people's pronouns are um, and how they like to be addressed. So just opening that up and creating that space. Um, is, is a, one, one tactic that you could try. Um, and uh, I guess it is, is just, in, just by the fact that you're taking the time to invite people into that conversation in space helps people feel more welcome and inclusive. Yeah, that's a more recent one that I've seen from some diversity and inclusion programs, but it is really good because if you create the space, it means that they don't have to force the issue into a space you get you're giving them a, a better opening to get into things okay well let's pop back to Miro or follow Brian's screen share either way so once you've you've had you're in the session or you've had a session already how do you know that it's working whatever you're doing. How do you know that people are engaged? How do you know that they're following what you're saying and that they're picking up on the direction things are going? There's a couple different ways. So this is the only time that I will use uh, specific design terminology, or at least I'll try not to. Um, we, ha um, we have a different, couple different kinds of assessment techniques. One is formative assessment, which is when you're checking in with the participants during your session it's usually more informal. It can be something just like, hey, you know, how's it going? Are you with me? 
give me a thumbs up if you're ready to move on. Or especially as, the, as a recorder or a graphic facilitator, you are capturing what the conversation is up on the board and the different input. So sometimes it's good to stop and say, am I capturing this correctly? Is anything missing? Because you're trying to be true to what the participants are saying and what they're coming up with. And you want to give them a chance to jump in and, and say if that's not, if, it's, if you haven't captured something they're saying or if you've captured it incorrectly. Um, body language is a big one. If you have somebody who's leaned in and making eye contact and seems very engaged, that's a really great sign that they're engaged. It's not the only sign, but it's a really good sign. Same as when you have somebody who's kind of leaning back and arms crossed and kind of a more defensive posture, that might be a, a sign that they're, that they're really not engaged, that there's something that's not resonating with them or the for, or, and going back to, there's other reasons people might not wanna be there, but for one reason or another, you're not engaging that person. You, as a graphic recorder, you're in a unique position to observe body language. What you can do about it and the level of engagement isn't as extensive as the facilitator, but you have to think about, you know, what, is there anything that you can do if the audience doesn't seem engaged? Is there any way that you can pull their attention back? Um, whether it's, you know, now I'm using neon colors or bright colors or I'm changing something or I'm making this big sweeping, you know, different kind of image now that might draw their attention back. Or even if you're capturing specific images that they've said, not that has been interpreted. That's always that can kind of pull, that might be able to pull them back. It might not, and sometimes it's harder to, it, it, sometimes there's nothing you can do because it's hard to engage people that aren't paying attention. Um, and if anybody's asleep, you have an even bigger problem with engagement than you thought you did. So going to summative assessment or summative assessment. Summative assessment is checking in with the participants at the end of or after the session. So this is really afterwards where you can do at the end, you can review the objectives that you had set out for the session, you can review the expectations the participants had and, and kind of get to, you know, were they met? And if things were not met, if you have the time, you can go back over them. Otherwise, you can refer them to other materials or an offline conversation or another session. Um, you can also send out a post-event survey or give them some kind of a feedback opportunity. Um, make sure that it's genuine because if you really don't care about their feedback and you're not going to change anything based on it, then don't ask for it. Because when people give their feedback, they, they like to feel that they're listened to and that they might have an impact on it. Same with formative assessment. If you are asking them something like, are you ready to move on? Or am I capturing this correctly? What are you going to do if they say they're not ready to move on? Or if the majority of the class says that they, that they don't get it? Do you have the time to revisit it? Do you have to move on anyway? And how will it affect the rest of your presentation if they are already at a point of not understanding or not engaged? Sometimes you do have space to respond to it and sometimes you don't. And it, it depends on a lot of how things have gone, what time was allocated. Uh, if you are you know, one of many speakers and you happen to be in the middle of the day, then there's not a lot of opportunity at all for you to move outside your time window. Does anybody else have any quick uh, questions or things that they like to do to check if their students are engaged? With training, there's a lot of classroom management tools um, to, that uh, different techniques and methods for, you know, things like, okay, you walk around the room. Um, this is especially effective with kids, but it works with adults too. If you're walking around the room and you could be behind them at any moment, then they're probably not going to be fidgeting quite as much or, or you know, reading the other book that they brought or doing something else. Um, 
they're more aware of where you are and what you're saying and doing. I like to, at the end of my sessions, create space and time for people to ask what their key takeaways or nuggets that they, they learned, as well as um, um, engaging in conversation around what they're so curious about, because then that gives me an opportunity to go back and refresh before we close with the session. That's a really good one too. And a lot of the key takeaways will give you more indication too on whether they honed in on what were the important, important points during your session. And especially if you get a lot of people grouped around the same key takeaways, you'll get a better idea of how much they understood. One of the things that we've done, Andrea, in um, classes where there's a lot of uh, technical information is having the students complete close exercises during lecture style. I mean, sometimes you just can't help it. It has to be lecture. So we'll have close exercises where they have to fill in the, the different blanks or answer questions kind of as a guided note taking or structured note taking for them to use. Okay, and that's another good memory technique too to help them anchor it, especially if it's been a lecture and they've been just listening for a period of time. Yep, and we've used we've even used memory palaces, so where you're actually constructing the the memory palace with different. Um, what were we doing? It was one of the one of the hacker types of network engineering courses and and it was just so very dense so using that memory palace to attach different terms and definitions was very helpful great yeah there are a lot of different memory devices to try and anchor learning that was one of the topics i was hoping we would be able to get into tonight but that was another one that um if i had a week i wouldn't be able to get into enough of them <laughs> so trying to honor your time this evening as well this is the uh, this is the last that I had for the session. So going back to the practice what you preach, how did we do? Um, do you feel like we just that we uh, accomplished our objectives for the evening with identify questions to ask your client that'll help you better plan for an event, discuss what objectives are and why they're useful, explain the importance of relevance to adult participants, recall different learning styles, discuss the better retention of information with more engaging activities, and describe when to assess audience engagement. Were there any topics that anybody had any lingering questions over? So Andrea, I have a question. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm constantly challenged with is knowing that there's multiple learning styles out there is how is it that I select or design modalities and activities that appeal to as many different learning styles as I can? Some of it depends on your role. Um, for example, from the graphic recorder role, um, I know a lot of recorders go, uh, are challenged with the balance of images versus text. But if you can get a good balance between the two, right there, you're hitting two different learning styles because you're anchoring it visually, but you're also having the wording to go along with it. Some courses, as I, like I mentioned earlier, some will have music playing in the background to try and to appeal to some of the people that need something, that, that they need to hear something, whether it's hearing the, the lecture itself or just hearing the music to kind of get, help them focus. A number of classroom training techniques people will use um, is to put um, different toys or, or fidget type items on a table. Uh, Play-Doh is always my favorite because watching adults play with Play-Doh never gets old. And they all do. They all play with it. But that helps them kind of have something to do with their hands and still be able to buy into what you're saying and listen and focus. So there's ways that you can present multiple learning styles depending on your role, depending on what resources are available to you in the room, um, depending on how much help or support you have. 
breaking people into groups for social learning or being able to give people individual assignments, those things will depend on the size of the group. It'll also depend on how many co-instructors or co-facilitators you have with you that can help manage those groups. Because if you've got uh, you know, 100 people that you're trying to break into groups, going back and forth between all the groups, trying to make sure that everybody is on task and, and knows what they're supposed to do can be very daunting. Thank you. So often uh, what I like to open with my um, any kind of session that I do is, a, is a, I draw what I call a weather report and I, got diff I draw different um, scales of weather from sunshine to a tornado and asking the group as they enter the session to um, identify where their mood is at in that moment when they come into the session. So um, it just creates space, a couple of things to help people understand that people might not be fully present for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes when you do that, it, it, um, the humor around the exercise creates people, uh, allows people an opportunity to share maybe, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit in a chaotic state because I got all these things going on. But it also, um, it, it, it's just a fun way to check in. Then halfway through, I might do it again. And then at the end, um, it just creates space for people to, that's it, <laughs> create space uh, to um, maybe share or as a facilitator or trainer, depending what role I'm playing, um, helps me identify that maybe um, I need to phrase things a little bit differently, create space or, or uh, be patient and not expect too much for those that are maybe not in a, a well state that day. I'd like to, I'd be interested to hear what other strategies people have tried. Now with your forecast, do you go back to them at the end of the session to see if it's changed? Absolutely. Yeah. And we talk about what, what, what happened in the session that, that changed that for them? Because sometimes it's not always good, right? It's good. It's live feedback, but um, um, you got to be prepared for that. But mm -hmm. most of the time, it's always from a positive intention. I love the weather forecast idea. I haven't seen that one before. I have seen some where they give um, a scale where you say, you know, at the beginning of this session, you know, this is how I felt about the topic. And one end is, you know, I feel like I know a lot and the other end might be, you know, I'm terrified and I don't know anything. And then you check in and again at the end of the session saying, how do you feel now? There's another one called Kano Kano. That's the smiley face, frowning face. And there's several, several variations of the faces too. Yeah, and Didi mentioned she does it with emoji pictures as well. Um, depending on how many emoji pictures you offer them, that could give you quite a range. No, no more than 10. <laughs> <laughs> I have been doing a year long um, learning session, a wellness session with a group of ladies in our organization and started the weather port with this group. And every time without fail, they add a different weather icon because I have what I have drawn, <laughs> they don't fit their mood. So I, I said to tell them to, you know, if they're in between, just identify that. Okay. I wouldn't think that there's a, a, a whole lot of options beyond the, the basic ones, but if you want to come up with your own, that could be interesting too. Does anybody else have any questions or want to add anything? Okay, if not, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording. Um, but before I do that, Andrea, thank you so much for your time. This is awesome. I've got a list of things in front of me here uh, of things that I'm going to apply to my next facilitation, which is like next week. <laughs> um, and I'm really excited about, yay, I'm just going to have people that are that much more engaged. So thank you so much for your time. Um, it will take me just about a week or so to uh, edit and clean up this re recording, and then it will be out there for, uh, for everybody else to, uh, to review. But uh, why don't we go ahead and show Andrea some appreciation. So thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you guys for coming and for participating.
And if you have any other questions, I'm just, I'm going to hang around for a few minutes still, just in case anybody wants to talk offline. 